Chapter 8 of All Roads Lead to Calvary. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. All Roads Lead to Calvary by Jerome K. Jerome. Chapter 8 She reached home in the evening. She thought to find her father in his study but they told her that, now, he usually sat alone in the great drawing-room. She opened the door softly. The room was dark, save for a flicker of firelight. She could see nothing, nor was there any sound. "'Dad!' she cried. "'Are you here?' He rose slowly from a high-backed chair beside the fire. "'It is you,' he said. He seemed a little dazed. She ran to him, and, seizing his listless arms, put them round her. "'Give me a hug, Dad,' she commanded. "'A real hug.' He held her to him for what seemed a long while. There was strength in his arms, in spite of the bowed shoulders and white hair. "'I was afraid you'd forgotten how to do it,' she laughed, when he at last released her. "'Do you know you haven't hugged me, Dad, since I was five years old? That's nineteen years ago.' You do love me, don't you? Yes, he answered. I've always loved you. She would not let him light the gas. I've, I've dined in the train, she explained. Let us talk by the firelight. She forced him gently back into his chair and seated herself upon the floor between his knees. What were you thinking of when I came in, she asked. You weren't asleep, were you? No, he answered. Not that sort of sleep. She could not see his face, but she guessed his meaning. "'Am I very like her?' she asked. "'Yes,' he answered, marvellously like her, as she used to be, except for just one thing. Perhaps that will come to you later. I thought, for the moment, as you stood there by the door. He did not finish the sentence. "'Tell me about her,' she said. "'I never knew she had been an actress.' He did not ask her how she had learnt it. She gave up when we were married, he said. The people she would have to live among would have looked askance at her if they'd known. There seemed no reason why they should. How did it all happen, she persisted. Was it very beautiful in the beginning? She wished she had not added that last. The words had slipped from her before she knew. Very beautiful, he answered, in the beginning. It was my fault he went on, that it was not beautiful all through. I ought to have let her take up her work again, as she wished to, when she found out what giving it up meant to her. The world was narrower then than it is now, and I listened to the world. I thought it another voice. It's difficult to tell, isn't it? she said. I wonder how one can. He did not answer, and they sat for a time in silence. "'Did you ever see her act?' asked Joan. "'Every evening for about six months,' he answered. "'A little flame shot up and showed a smile upon his face. "'I owe to her all the charity and tenderness I know. "'She taught it to me in those months. "'I might have learned more if I'd let her go on teaching. "'It was the only way she knew.' "'Joan watched her as gradually she shaped herself out of the shadows. "'The poor, thin fretful lady of the ever-restless hands, with her bursts of jealous passion, her long moods of sullen indifference, all her music turned to waste. "'How did she come to fall in love with you?' asked Joan. "'I don't mean to be uncomplimentary, Dad,' she laughed, taking his hand in hers and stroking it. "'You must have been ridiculously handsome when you were young, and you must always have been strong and brave and clever.' I can see such a lot of women falling in love with you, but not the artistic woman. It wasn't so incongruous at the time, he answered. My father had sent me out to America to superintend a contract. It was the first time I had ever been away from home, though I was nearly thirty, and all my pent-up youth rushed out of me all at once. It was a harem scarum fellow, mad with the joy of life that made love to her, not the man who went out nor the man who came back. It was at San Francisco that I met her. 
She was touring the western states, and I let everything go to the wind and followed her. It seemed to me that heaven had opened up to me. I fought a duel in Colorado with a man who had insulted her. The law didn't run there in those days, and three of his hired gunmen, as they called them, held us up that night in the train and gave her the alternative of going back with them and kissing him, or seeing me dead at her feet. I didn't give her time to answer, nor for them to finish. It seemed a fine death anyhow that, and I'd have faced hell itself for the chance of fighting for her. Though she told me afterwards that if I'd died, she'd have gone back with him and killed him. Joan did not speak for a time. She could see him, grave, a little pompous in his Sunday black, his footsteps creaking down the stone-flagged aisle, the silver-edged collecting bag held stiffly in his hand. Couldn't you have saved a bit, Daddy? she asked of all that wealth of youth, just enough to live on? I might, he answered, if I'd known the value of it. I found a cable waiting for me in New York. My father had been dead a month, and I had to return immediately. And so you married her, and took her drum away from her, said Joan. Oh, the thing God gives to some of us, he explained, to make a little noise with and set the people marching. The little flame died out. She could feel his body trembling. But you still loved her, didn't you, Dad? she asked. I was very little at the time, but I can just remember. You seemed so happy together, till her illness came. It was more than love, he answered. It was idolatry. God punished me for it. He was a hard God, my God. She raised herself, putting her hands upon his shoulders, so that her face was very close to his. "'What has become of him, Dad?' she said. She spoke in a cold voice, as one does of a false friend. "'I do not know,' he answered her. "'I don't seem to care.' "'He must be somewhere,' she said. "'The living God of love and hope, the God that Christ believed in.' "'They were his last words, too,' he answered. "'My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me?' "'No, not his last,' said Joan. "'Lo, I am with you always even unto the end of the world. Love was Christ, God. He will help us to find him. Their arms were about one another. Joan felt that a new need had been born in her, the need of loving and of being loved. It was good to lay her head upon his breast and know that he was glad of her coming. He asked her questions about herself, but she could see that he was tired. So she told him it was too important a matter to start upon so late. She would talk about herself tomorrow. It would be Sunday. Do you still go to the chapel? She asked him, a little hesitatingly. Yes, he answered. One lives by habit. It's the only temple I know, he continued after a moment. Perhaps God, one day, will find me there. He rose and lit the gas and a letter on the mantelpiece caught his eye. "'Have you heard from Arthur?' he asked, suddenly turning to her. "'No, not since about a month,' she answered. "'Why?' "'He'll be pleased to find you here, waiting for him,' he said with a smile, handing her the letter. "'He'll be here some time tomorrow.' Arthur Alway was her cousin, the son of a nonconformist minister. Her father had taken him into the works, and for the last three years... He'd been in Egypt, helping in the laying of a tramway line. He was in love with her. At least, so they all told her. And his letters were certainly somewhat committal. Joan replied to them, when she did not forget to do so, in a studiously sisterly vein, and always reproved him for unnecessary extravagance whenever he sent her a present. The letter announced his arrival at Southampton. He would stop at Birmingham, where his parents lived, for a couple of days, and be in Liverpool on Sunday evening, so as to be able to get straight to business on Monday morning. Joan handed back the letter. It contained nothing else. It only came an hour or two ago, her father explained. If he wrote to you by the same post, you may have left before it arrived. So long as he doesn't think that I came down specially to see him, I don't mind, said Joan. They both laughed. He's a good lad, said her father. They kissed good night, 
and Joan went up to her own room. She found it just as she had left it. A bunch of roses stood upon the dressing table. Her father would never let anyone cut his roses but himself. Young Galway arrived just as Joan and her father had sat down to supper. A place had been laid for him. He flushed with pleasure at seeing her, but was not surprised. I called at your diggings, he said. I had to go through London. They told me you had started. It is good of you. No, it isn't, said Joan. I came down to see Dad. I didn't know you were back. She spoke with some asperity, and his face fell. How are you? she added, holding out her hand. You've grown quite good looking. I like your moustache. And he flushed again with pleasure. He had a sweet, almost girlish face, with delicate skin that the Egyptian sun had deepened into ruddiness, with soft, dreamy eyes and golden hair. He looked lithe and agile rather than strong. He was shy at first, but once set going, talked freely, and was interesting. His work had taken him into the desert, far from the beaten tracks. He described the life of the people, very little different from what it must have been in Noah's time. For months he had been the only white man there, and had lived among them. What had struck him was how little he had missed all the paraphernalia of civilization once he'd got over the first shock. He had learnt their sports and games, wrestled and swum and hunted with them, provided one was a little hungry and tired with toil, a stew of goat's flesh with sweet cakes and fruits, washed down with wine out of a sheep's skin, made a feast. And after, there was music and singing and dancing, or the travelling storyteller would gather round him his rapt audience. Paris had only robbed women of their grace and dignity. He preferred the young girls in their costume of the 14th dynasty. Progress, he thought, had tended only to complicate life and render it less enjoyable. All the essentials of happiness, love, courtship, marriage, the home, children, friendship, social intercourse and play, were independent of it, had always been there for the asking. Joan thought his mistake lay in regarding man's happiness as more important to him than his self-development. It was not what we got out of civilization, but what we put into it that was our gain. Its luxuries and ostentations were, in themselves, perhaps bad for us, but the pursuit of them was good. It called forth thought and effort, sharpened our wits, strengthened our brains. Primitive man, content with his necessities, would never have produced genius. Art, literature, science would have been stillborn. He hesitated before replying, glancing at her furtively while crumbling his bread. When he did, it was in the tone that one of her younger disciples might have ventured into a discussion with Hypatia. But he stuck to his guns. How did she account for David and Solomon? Moses and the prophets. They had sprung from a shepherd race. Yet surely there was genius. Literature. Greece owed nothing to progress. She had preceded it. Her thinkers, her poets, her scientists, had drawn their inspiration from nature, not civilization. Her art had sprung, full-grown out of the soil. We had never surpassed it. But the Greek ideal could not have been the right one, or Greece would not so utterly have disappeared, suggested Mr. Alway. Unless you reject the law of the survival of the fittest. He had no qualms about arguing with his uncle. So did Archimedes disappear, he answered with a smile. The nameless Roman soldier remained. That was hardly the survival of the fittest. He thought it the tragedy of the world that Rome had conquered Greece imposing her lower ideals upon the race. Rome should have been the servant of Greece, the hands directed by the brain. She would have made roads and harbours, conducted the traffic, reared the marketplace. She knew of the steam engine, employed it for pumping water in the age of the Antonines. Sooner or later she would have placed it on rails and in ships. Rome should have been the 
policemen, keeping the world in order, making it a fit habitation. Her mistake was in regarding these things as an end in themselves, dreaming of nothing beyond. From her, we had inherited the fallacy that man was made for the world, not the world for man. Rome organised only for man's body. Greece would have legislated for his soul. They went into the drawing room. Her father asked her to sing, and Arthur opened the piano for her and lit the candles. She chose some ballads and a song of Herrick's, playing her own accompaniment while Arthur turned the leaves. She had a good voice, a low contralto. The room was high and dimly lighted. It looked larger than it really was. Her father sat in his usual chair beside the fire and listened with half-closed eyes. Glancing now and then across at him, she was reminded of Orchardson's picture. She was feeling sentimental, a novel sensation to her. She rather enjoyed it. She finished with one of Byrne's lyrics, and then told Arthur that it was now his turn, and that she would play for him. He shook his head, pleading that he was out of practice. "'I wish it,' she said, speaking low, and it pleased her that he made no answer but to ask her what he should sing. He had a light tenor voice. It was wobbly at first, but improved as he went on. They ended with a duet. The next morning she went into town with them. She never seemed to have any time in London and wanted to do some shopping. They joined her again for lunch and afterwards, at her father's suggestion, she and Arthur went for a walk. They took the tram out of the city and struck into the country. The leaves still lingered brown and red upon the trees. He carried a cloak and opened gates for her and held back brambles while she passed. She had always been indifferent to these small gallantries, but today she welcomed them. She wished to feel her power to attract and command. They avoided all subjects on which they could differ, even in words. They talked of people and places they had known together. They remembered their common love of animals and told of the comedies and tragedies that had befallen their pets. Joan's regret was that she had not now even a dog thinking it cruel to keep them in London. She hated the women she met, dragging the poor little depressed beasts about at the end of a string, savage with them if they dared to stop for a moment to exchange a passing wag of the tail with some other lonely sufferer. It was as bad as keeping a lark in a cage. She had tried a cat, but so often she did not get home till late, and that was just the time when the cat wanted to be out, so they seldom met. He suggested a parrot. His experience of them was that they had no regular hours and would willingly sit up all night, if encouraged, and talk all the time. Joan's objection to running a parrot was that it stamped you as an old maid, and she wasn't that, at least not yet. She wondered if she could make an owl really happy. Minerva had an owl. He told her how one spring, walking across a common after a fire, he had found a mother thrush burnt to death upon her nest, her charred wings spread out in a vain endeavour to protect her brood. He had buried her there, among the blackened thorn and furs, and placed a little cross of stones above her. I hope nobody saw me, he said with a laugh, but I couldn't bear to leave her there, unhonoured. It's one of the things that make me less certain than I want to be of a future existence, said Joan. The thought that animals can have no part in it, that all their courage and love and faithfulness dies with them and is wasted. Are you sure it is? he answered. It would be so unreasonable. They had tea at an old-fashioned inn beside a stream. It was a favourite resort in summer time, but now they had it to themselves. The wind had played pranks with her hair, and he found a mirror and knelt before her, holding it. She stood erect, looking down at him while seeming to be absorbed in the rearrangement of her hair, feeling a little ashamed of herself. She was encouraging him. There was no other word for it. She seemed to have developed a sudden penchant for this sort of thing. 
it would end in his proposing to her, and then she would have to tell him that she cared for him only in a cousinly sort of way, whatever that might mean, and that she could never marry him. She dared not ask herself why. She must manoeuvre to put it off as long as possible, and meanwhile some opening might occur to enlighten him. She would talk to him about her work, and explain to him how she had determined to devote her life to it, to the exclusion of all other distractions. If, then, he chose to go on loving her, or if he couldn't help it, that would not be her fault. After all, it did him no harm. She could always be gracious and kind to him. It was not as if she had tricked him. He had always loved her. Kneeling before her, serving her, it was evident it made him supremely happy. It would be cruel of her to end it. The landlady entered unexpectedly with the tea, but he did not rise till Joan turned away, nor did he seem disconcerted, neither did the landlady. She was an elderly, quiet-eyed woman, and had served more than one generation of young people with their teas. They returned home by train. Joan insisted on travelling third class, and selected a compartment containing a stout woman and two children. Arthur had to be at the works. An important contract had got behindhand, and they were working overtime. She and her father dined alone. He made her fulfil her promise to talk about herself, and she told him all she thought would interest him. She passed lightly over her acquaintance with Phillips. He would regard it as highly undesirable, she told herself, and it would trouble him. He was reading her articles in the Sunday Post, as also her letters from Clorinda, and of the two preferred the latter as being less subversive of law and order. Also, he did not like seeing her photograph each week, displayed across two columns with her name beneath in one-inch type. He supposed he was old-fashioned. She was getting rather tired of it herself. The editor insisted upon it, she explained. It was worth it for the opportunity it gives me. I preach every Sunday to a congregation of over a million souls. It's better than being a bishop. Besides, she added, the men are just as bad. You see their silly faces everywhere. <laughs> That's like you women, he answered with a smile. You pretend to be superior, and then you copy us. She laughed, but the next moment she was serious. No, we don't, she said. Not those of us who think. We know we shall never oust man from his place. He will always be the greater. We want to help him, that's all. But that wasn't the Lord's idea, he said, when he gave Eve to Adam to be his helpmeet. Yes, that was all right, she answered. He fashioned Eve for Adam and saw that Adam got her. The ideal marriage might have been the ideal solution. If the Lord had intended that, he should have kept the matchmaking in his own hands, not left it to man. Somewhere in Athens there must have been the helpmeet God had made for Socrates. When they met, it was Xanthippe that she kissed. A servant brought the coffee and went out again. Her father lighted a cigar and handed her the cigarettes. Will it shock you, Dad? she asked. Rather late in the day for you to worry yourself about that, isn't it? he answered with a smile. He struck a match and held it for her. Joan sat with her elbows on the table and smoked in silence. She was thinking. Why had he never brought her up, never exacted obedience from her, never even tried to influence her? It could not have been mere weakness. She stole a sidelong glance at the tired, lined face with its steel-blue eyes. She had never seen them other than calm, but they must have been able to flash. Why had he always been so just and kind and patient with her? Why had he never scolded her and bullied her and teased her? Why had he let her go away, leaving him lonely in his empty, voiceless house? Why had he never made any claim upon her? The idea came to her as an inspiration. At least it would ease her conscience. Why don't you let Arthur live here, she said, instead of going back to his lodgings? It would be company for you. He did not answer for some time. She had begun to wonder if he'd heard. What do you think of him? 
he asked, without looking at her. Oh, he's quite a nice lad, she answered. It was some while again before he spoke. He'll be the last of the always, he said. I should like to think of the name being continued, and he's a good businessman in spite of his dreaminess. Perhaps he would get on better with the men. She seized at the chance of changing the subject. It was a foolish notion, she said, that of the Manchester school that men and women could be treated as mere figures in a sum. To her surprise, he agreed with her. The feudal system had a fine idea in it, he said. If it had been honestly carried out, a master should be the friend, the helper of his men. They should be one family. She looked at him a little incredulously, remembering the bitter periods of strikes and lockouts. Did you ever try, Dad? she asked. Oh, yes, he answered, but I tried the wrong way. The right way might be found, he added, by the right man and woman. She felt that he was watching her through his half-closed eyes. There are those cottages, he continued, just before you come to the bridge. They might be repaired, and a clubhouse added. The idea is catching on, they tell me. Garden villages, they call them now. It gets the men and women away from the dirty streets and gives the children a chance. She knew the place. A sad group of dilapidated little houses forming three sides of a paved quadrangle, with a shattered fountain and withered trees in the centre. Ever since she could remember, they had stood there empty, ghostly, with creaking doors and broken windows, their gardens overgrown with weeds. Are they yours? she asked. She had never connected them with the works, some half a mile away. Though had she been curious, she might have learnt that they were known as Always Folly. Your mother's, he answered. I built them the year I came back from America and gave them to her. I thought it would interest her. Perhaps it would if, if I had left her to her own ways. Why didn't they want them? she asked. They did at first, he answered. The time servers and the hypocrites among them. I made it a condition that they should be teetotalers and chapel-goers and everything else that I thought good for them. I thought that I could save their souls by bribing them with cheap rents and a share of the profits. And then the union came and that, of course, finished it. So he, too, had thought to build Jerusalem. Yes, he said. I'll sound him out about giving up his lodgings. Joan lay awake for a long while that night. The moon looked in at the window. It seemed to have got itself entangled in the tops of the tall pines. Would it not be a duty to come back? Make her father happy? To say nothing of the other? He was a dear, sweet, lovable lad. Together, they might realise her father's dream. Repair the blunders, plant gardens where the weeds now grew. Drive out the sad old ghosts with living voices. It had been a fine thought. A king's thought. Others had followed, profiting by his mistakes, but might it not be carried further than even they had gone? Shaped into some noble venture that should serve the future. Was not her America here? Why seek it further? What was this unknown force that, against all sense and reason, seemed driving her out into the wilderness to preach? Might it not be mere vanity? Mere egoism? Almost, she had convinced herself. And then there flashed remembrance of her mother. She, too, had laid aside herself, had thought that love and duty could teach one to be other than one was. The ego was the all-important thing, entrusted to us as the talents of silver to the faithful servant, to be developed, not for our own purposes, but for the service of the master. One did no good by suppressing one's nature. In the end, it proved too strong. Marriage with Arthur would be only repeating the mistake. To be worshipped, to be served. It would be very pleasant when one was in the mood, but it would not satisfy her. There was something strong and fierce and primitive in her nature, something that had come down to her through the generations from some harness-girded ancestress, something impelling her instinctively to choose the fighter, 
to share with him the joy of battle, healing his wounds, giving him of her courage, exulting with him in the victory. The moon had risen clear of the entangling pines. It rolled serene and free. Her father came to the station with her in the morning. The trade was not in, and they walked up and down and talked. Suddenly she remembered it had slipped her mind. Could I, as a child, have known an old clergyman, she asked him. At least he wouldn't have been old then. I dropped into Chelsea Church one evening and heard him preach, and on the way home I passed him again in the street. It seemed to me that I had seen his face before, but not for many years. I meant to write to you about it, but forgot. He had to turn aside for a moment to speak to an acquaintance about business. Oh, it's possible, he answered on rejoining her. What was his name? I do not know, she answered. He was not the regular incumbent, but it was someone that I seemed to know quite well, that I must have been familiar with. It may have been, he answered carelessly, though the gulf was wider then than it is now. I'll try and think. Perhaps it's only your fancy. The train drew in, and he found her a corner seat and stood talking by the window about common things. What did he preach about? he asked her unexpectedly. She was puzzled for the moment. Oh, the old clergyman, she answered, recollecting. Oh, Calvary. All roads lead to Calvary, he thought. It was rather interesting. She looked back at the end of the platform. He had not moved. End of chapter 8 Read by Bryn Roberts, Kings Winford, November 2022